Well, God bless you. Listen, this is Pastor Ray. I am so honored and delighted to have you to turn this way. And we're getting ready to carry you into a message that I preached not very long ago. I think it will bless you, your household, and your family. God move in such mysterious ways as wonders are to perform. I want to carry in and let you listen to this message. We'll be back a little later. Let's go into church. When you find it, say amen. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thank you so much. I want to talk a little while about the gospel. The gospel. Hear me say, the gospel. I'm always interested and fascinated as to how different pensmen approach each particular text in the Bible. Scholars said that Matthew and Luke gathered their manuscript from Mark. Mark, of course, wrote to a different group than Matthew and Luke. Matthew wrote to the Jews. Luke wrote to the Greeks. Mark wrote to the Romans. When you watch Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew's book is filled with parables. Luke's penmanship is filled with miracles. Because Matthew said Jesus was a king. Kings speak. Mark said Jesus wrote to the Romans, and Romans believed that he was a servant servants produce. Matthew said that Jesus talked. Mark said he walked his talk. When you follow Mark's writing, you're almost out of breath trying to keep up with him because he moved through his passages so swift. He give us only 16 chapters in Mark's pensmanship. Scholars say in those 16 chapters, he covered only 180 days of the life of Jesus. Not like Matthew. Matthew carried him to, through 28 chapters, Luke through 24 chapters, Mark only 16. When you read Mark, you see Jesus moving in and out. Matter of fact, Mark had Jesus performing a miracle on the way to perform another miracle. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it's the same day when evening was come. He said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was with him also other little ships. There rose a great storm of wind and beat into the ship, so it was now full. And Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And there rose a great storm of wind that beat into the ship, so it was now full. And Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. They awakened him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? The same story is mentioned in Matthew chapter 8. But Matthew said when they awakened Jesus, they called him Lord. Lord is the word kurios in the Greek. It means to be the Lord over. Master is the daskasi in the Greek, mean teacher. Matthew said that Jesus was the Lord over the storm. But Luke said that Mark said he came to teach them something. You see, if you've never been in a storm, you never know how to handle a storm. So Mark said that Jesus 
carried the disciples into the storm to teach them how to handle storms. Sometimes we get advice from people about storms that have never been in a storm. You see, it is difficult for you to have a testimony if you have not experienced a test. If you have experienced a test, then you can understand a testimony. Now, mind you, Jesus, when he left one side going to the other, he did not say to the disciples, we're going under. He said, we're going over. They were on the way to the other side because there was a demoniac man over there that had been possessed with the devils a long time. They were going to the other side to deal with the demoniac man, but Jesus said, since we're going, Mark writes, I might as well teach you a lesson on the way. I like it because he teaches us stuff on the way. After they made it to the other side, the demoniac man was there, Jesus went says Mark, and he cast the demons out of the man. Soon as he cast out the demons, he got back in the ship to go again back to the other side. It means Jesus left one side going to the other just for one man. You see, most of us won't go far for just one. We have to have a mass. We have to have a crowd. But Jesus went a long ways just to heal just one. I really think if there was nobody on the planet but me, Jesus still would have came and died just for me because he major in one. Jesus knew how to multiply. He knew how to take one and make two and two to make four and four to make eight and eight to make 16 and 16 to make 32 and 32 to make 64 and 6,428. He knew he can start with just one. After he got back into the ship and came to the other side, Jairus met him, and he said, My daughter lieth at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be healed and shall live. Jesus accepted the invitation to go to Jairus' house, but Mark said, while he was on his way to Jairus' house, Mark throws in another miracle. He said, while he was on his way, there met him a woman by the name of Veronica. She came and pressed her way through the crowd and touched the hem on the hem. She touched the H-E-M hem that was wrapped around the H-I-M hem. Talk to me, somebody. The strangest thing, the, ger the girl was 12 years of age at the point of death. The woman had been sick 12 years. You ever notice how God lets you bump into somebody <laughs> that's been going through what you're going through for a long time? <laughs> And sometimes you're ready to throw in the towel and you bump into somebody and say, child, that ain't nothing. I've been going through what you're going through all my life and I'm still hanging on. Sometimes we call it a coincidence, but it is divine providence. God allows us to run into difficult situations. Mark said that Jesus stayed busy. He opened his penmanship by saying the beginning. I like to hang on to words because words are there for a reason. The word beginning, the statement beginning is several, mentioned several times in the Bible. Genesis 1 and 1, John 1 and 1, 1 John 1 and 1, and then of course Mark 1 and 1. Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word. 1 John 1 and 1, that which was from the beginning and mark one and one the beginning of the gospel mark said the gospel had a beginning if mark said the gospel had a beginning evidently the gospel had a beginning the first beginning of the gospel was in the mind of god the father because revelation 13 8 said the son of man was slain before the foundation of the world it means before Jesus was born at Bethlehem, he had already died at Calvary. That's hard for us to comprehend. How can a person die before they're born? It's because Jesus don't count like we count. Jesus doesn't have to leave anywhere to get anywhere. Talk to me, somebody. That's why Psalms 23 starts by saying the Lord is. He's always an is God. Yesterday he is. Today he is. Tomorrow he is. 
That's why people say you can't hurry God. You just got to wait because God is already where you're trying to get to. Y'all don't like that. That's why when it put the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, they threw three in, but when they looked, they saw Jesus walking in the midst of them. The question was, when did Jesus get in there? He was already in there. Talk to me, somebody. When the king decided to put the boys in the furnace, Jesus was waiting on them. Anybody know he worked that way? Jesus can show up. When he show up, he shows out. And when he shows out, he takes over. Whenever he get ready to take over. Y'all know I did come to preach today. He can do what he want to do whenever he get ready to do it. He said the beginning of the gospel, it was in the mind of God the Father. God had a thought. God decided to put the thought into action. He decided in his mind, not only that Jesus would be born, but that Jesus would die. You see, God never do an afterthought. He don't wait till man mess up and then try to find a solution to get man saved. See, God knew when he made Adam, after he ran into Eve and they was going to end up in the garden, he already knew when he made man that he was going to mess up, and yet he made it. Like so in your own personal life, it's no shock to God when you make a mistake. God knew you was going to make a mistake before he saved you, but he saved you anyway. <laughs> Preach from <Reverend> Ray. <laughs> I mean, there's no surprise to God. I'm looking at somebody here now. You say, I want to go to God and ask him for forgiveness for the sin that I've, I've committed. I need to tell you that God already knew it. He knew what you was going to do before he saved you, and he saved you anyway. That's why you need to come not as a surprise to God and say, I'm sorry for the sin that I have committed. He said, the beginning the gospel. The first was in the mind of God the Father. The second beginning of the gospel was in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That means that that was far off became near. That that we could not see, he made it visible so that we could see. Because the Old Testament taught us and gave us the road map from time to eternity. The only problem, we had a problem reading the map. It's kind of like if somebody asks you, say, can you tell me how to get to Millington from here? You say, well, tell you what, go out Parkway, go north, go west Parkway, run into Lamar, take Lamar to 240, hit 240, take it over to 51, they go do it right on 51, take it straight out to Millington. You say, huh? They say, all right. Get behind me. God gave us the map to get from time to eternity. But man had a problem reading the map. He said, all right, I'll show up myself. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham was getting ready to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And he was on his way to the mountain. And his son Isaac said, Father, I see the fire. I see the wood, I see the knife, I see the rope, but where is the lamb? Abraham said, my son, God will provide. The word provide is a compound word. Pro mean before. Fide is where you get the word video. Something you see mean God saw it before. God will provide himself. God will provide him Seth, God will wrap himself up in human flesh and come down and die for mankind. What was the purpose of Jesus becoming, taking the word and becoming flesh? Here it is. He can now die. You see, before he became flesh, he couldn't die. But now he can die because in order for me to live, somebody had to die. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, tried to sow fig leaves to make themselves aprons to hide from God. Verse 21, 22, 23, said so God sold coats of skin on them and covered Adam and Eve nakedness, meaning this. Number one, God was the first seamstress in the Bible. 
Secondly, he took coats of skin, which meant the skin had to come from somewhere. You don't get skin off an animal till you kill the animal, which meant if he got coats of skin, something had to die. And if something died, that meant some blood had to be shed. He said, in order for you to be covered, something got to die. And for us to be saved, somebody had to die. First beginning was in the mind of God. Second began was in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The third beginning was in the church. Second Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That means you have new inspiration, new aspiration. Start looking with new observations, counting with a new calculation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The gospel had its beginning. The beginning of the gospel. Y'all ain't said nothing, but I know I'm preaching. Y'all ain't seen me in a while. It's the beginning of the gospel. The Greek word for gospel is you in Gilead. That means good news. Thank God we can hear some good news. Because every time you turn on the television, the news is not good. Every time you read your paper, the news is not good. Every time you read your text messages, ain't no good news. But thank God, that's good news on the wire. The gospel is good News, you on Gilead, you on Galitzama. It means good news. Thank God it's good because you keep showing up. The gospel has an unusual way of dealing with us. It don't deal with everybody the same way. Everybody can't leave church feeling the same way every Sunday. It depends on where you are spiritually. You know how some people leave shouting and some folk leave pouting. Some people leave mad and some people leave glad. It depends on where you are spiritually. If you ain't there spiritually, you may leave with your head down because the gospel is not designed to entertain you. The gospel is designed to help you. It is designed to make you better, not bitter. And sometimes bitterness will show up before bitterness take over. Do I have a witness? How is it that the gospel is so powerful? It is because of what the gospel is made up. 2 Timothy 3.16 So all scripture is given by the inspiration. They are prenuma. The Greek word for inspiration, theos, is the Greek word for God. Prenuma is where you get the word pneuma. It's where you get the word pneumonia from. Huh. Pneuma mean wind, breath, and spirit. Meaning that the word of God is the breath of God. Mm -hmm. You see, you can go home and get your balloon, deflated balloon, blow your breath in that balloon, keep blowing until you inflate it up as far as you can carry it, tie a knot in it, turn it loose. You can pick it up in Jackson, Tennessee, but when you get it, take it to your laboratory. Put it under the microscope and you will discover your DNA is in that balloon. Well, you can get the word of God and take it to the divine laboratory and look at it. It will have God's DNA in it. 
Because the word of God is not man-made, it's God's breath. That's why it's so powerful. It's not just somebody talking, it's the breath of God. Genesis 2, 7, they formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostril the breath, ruach, R-U-A-C-H, Hebrew word for breath. God got you alive because God's breath is in you. And because his breath is in you, that breath must be nourished by another breath. That's the word of God. Preach Reverend Ray. It is the word. Shout word of God. In the New Testament, there are two words in the original language for the word. Word one is the word logos. The other is the word rhema. Logos is the written word. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word. That's the logos. Matthew 4 and 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's the rhema word. Huh. Romans 10, 17, faith come by hearing. Hearing come through by the word. That's the rhema. Y'all hear me, don't you? Now the rhema must work from the Logos. If you don't have the Logos written word in you, the rhema word won't work for you. Let me see if I can drop it in your spirit. You see, when you have the Logos word, God will text you a rhema word. Let me talk to this side over here. When you have the written word in you, God will text you a rhema word. My daughter, you hear me say it all the time. She called me every day, wherever I am, here or there, wherever. She's going to call me to check on me. Thank God she do check on me. Every day, getting old as I am, anything can happen. She check on me. And then when I don't have a chance to call her back, I'll try to text her. And it was why she thinks she's my mama and so she called herself trying to get on me because you didn't call back. I said, baby, I didn't call you, but I text you. Read the text. Sometime God, we want to get on God, so I call you. But you didn't call me back. God said, but I text you to have a witness in this house. God, I call on you for help. I needed help so bad she didn't call me back. He said, but I text you. In Psalms 121 verse 1, I lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. Lord, I cried all night long. I call you about it. You didn't call me back, he said, but I text you. And Psalms 30 verse 5, weeping me, endure for a night. But joy will come in the morning. Lord, the enemy start trying to get all around me. I call you, but you didn't call me back, he said, but I text you. And Psalms 27 verse 1, 2 and 3, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemy, the wicked come up against me to eat of my flesh, they stumble and fail. Do I have a witness? It is important that you know the word. Listen at what he said in 2 Timothy 2.15. Steady. The Greek word for steady is spundazo. Spundazo doesn't mean just sit down with a book before you're reading. It means be diligent. Talk to me something. That means if you're going to study the word, find out something about the word. Because many times you read it, and because you read it out of context, it don't make sense. You try to butt something from Psalms into some of the prophets and butt something from the prophet out of the gospel. Find out the content and what happened when you read what you read. Y'all in this house, we have to learn how 
Help me say, to study. You read that passage in the Old Testament where it says, a man should not, a woman should not wear garments pertaining to a man. Is on her right there. It says, women can't wear dresses, can't wear pants in church. Well, just what happened during that day when the text was written, men were wearing dresses. You will help me, won't you? And five verses down, it said, don't wear mixed garments. You, you missed that. That means don't wear cotton and silk at the same time. It was a law that was in place during the Mosaic time. I wish I had some help in this house. But when you learn the culture as to where you are, what's taking place, you can understand the text a little better. Some things you see, you don't understand it just by reading it at face value. You, the, the text says you got to study. To show thyself approved, a workman under God that need not error, rightly divided, atha to motoros, the word rightly divided. Atha means straight, to motoros means to cut. It came from the idea that in the days of the apostle Paul, Paul was a tent maker. And while making his tent, he had to cut the seam of the material straight. Because if the material had jagged edges, when you would sew the material, it would have leaks in the temple. And leaks in the temple wasn't good for you. Here's what Paul said, when people come to church, they come with leaking tents. We have some help in this house. Well, God bless you. Listen, we're out of time, but you see, we're certainly not out of message. I hope you've been blessed while listening to just a portion of this message. I think the message will be a blessing to your household. Just order this message, 1-800-375-4007, or you can write to the God is Good Ministry, 2237 South Parkway, East Memphis, Tennessee. Zip 38114 or go to God is Good Ministry. Love for you to check us out. Be blessed.